be awkward if I stand over there. So I'm just stand over. Okay, good morning, everybody. I don't know if all of you know me or not, but my name is Mason Sorrell, and I will be your preacher, pastor, minister, servant guy today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last year I preached, and you now I was pretty nervous and all that. You know, Youth Sunday is always a big time for everybody getting up and getting out of their comfort zone, and trying to kind of meet new people and do something for the first time. And last year I had a pretty good time, you know, preaching and all, but I feel like this Sunday I have a little bit more expectation, like I have to do better than last time. <laughs> I don't really know why, but I mean, last time, you know, we were looking for a new pastor, and I was trying to, it was more like an interview for me, I was trying to you know, impress everybody. You know, and I, I kind of sent in my resume, you know, for the pastor search committee, and they kind of came back to me and said, you know what, we're just kind of looking for someone a little bit more mature, a little bit more time under their belt, you know. And I was okay with that, I can understand, still in high school and everything. And then, <laughs> but I don't have jobs. So. <laughs> but then they went out and hired Brian. <laughs> I mean, not all people, I mean, I love Brian, he's a great guy, but they're looking for maturity. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm just going to start off with our opening passage, and that's going to be Acts 4.12, if you'll turn to that. You guys have probably heard this in your Sunday school class. This is what we're building off of today. I'm going to refer back to this multiple times, but in Acts 4.12 it states, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. I'm going to read that again. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You know, in context, this, this can kind of confuse somebody because a name nowadays is such a general term that we can't apply to a specific thing. You know, I mean, a name doesn't really say much, but as a title by which you go by. The definition of a name is a word or set of, a word or set of words by which a person, animal, or place is known for, addressed, or referred to. And when I looked this up on Google, it gave me a subtext to identity. I feel like that applies more to a name nowadays than what it should, because a name should be your identity, who you are who you identify yourself as. And just, like I said, nowadays we, we kind of lose what a name is. Because, I mean, we our names don't really mean anything. And, you know, that, that's what mine means, stone worker. But that, I'm not a stone worker. <laughs> so names are very important part of culture in biblical times, unlike they are now. And if we go back into the... Old Testament and kind of look up what some of these names mean, we get more out of understanding about how important a name is to a person and who they actually are. So if you're turning to me to Exodus 2.10. Exodus 2.10 is talking about Moses and it says, when the child grew older, she took him into she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. And we see that Moses' name is a name of origin. And that, that's an important part of who he is because it gives him context about where he came from. You know, it, it's so simple just saying, oh, he came from the water. But it, it, it means a lot more to that because we see that specifically the Pharaoh's daughter, she took him in out of the water, something so pure, and applied it to him. So we can look at Moses with a stronger sense than just Moses. We can see where he came from, who he actually is. And this is a very common theme in the Old Testament, because even Samuel, if you'll flip to there, that's 1 Samuel 1.10. 1 Samuel 1.10. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a, sh a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. You know, it, origin is a very common theme, because when you meet someone, 
oh, my name is Samuel. And in that language of the time, they would understand what that means. Now, nowadays, we don't have a specific one word for a phrase. But back then, something so simple as Samuel could, des could describe what he actually is and where he came from. And even as we move on into Genesis, uh, we, we see Joseph. And that's uh, Genesis 41, 44 through 45. If I can find it. Okay, Genesis 44, or Genesis 41, 44 through 45. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name of Zephinath, Fina, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Prophetera, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. And Joseph's new name gave him power. It established authority over all of Egypt because, as it states in 44, without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. And as a new name giving you power to control an entire country, it shows you how much that means to who they are. I mean, just giving me a new name and I become like the president of the United States, you know, it doesn't really work that way nowadays, but back then, a new change or a new idea could develop somebody in such a way that it empowered them to do much more than who they were before. You know, like I said, our names don't really carry that much meaning like they used to. My name's Mason Sorrell, Mason being stone worker, and you know, no one really works with stones anymore, so that doesn't <laughs> apply to me. And then my last name is Sorrell, and that means of red hair. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I, I honestly don't know. Our entire family doesn't have red hair, so. <laughs> I, hey, it's not your maiden name. We <laughs> decided. <laughs> Not, when I was writing this, I had to I had to put myself in a position to say, how can we use our names to minister to the people? You know, unlike back then, without our names carrying weight, we can't apply it to people. We can't we can't on a personal level interact. Because I mean, we I had to go through every single one of your guys' names a couple days ago and write down what they meant. Because, I mean, most of you guys probably didn't know what your name means, so... <laughs> I mean, but realistically, you can't go, Oh, my name is Mason Sorrell, stone worker of red hair, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really work like that anymore. And on that same topic of how we can use our names to minister to the people, I look to Acts 13.9, and that's... I would say that's the focal point of where I'm going with that, so if all of you guys can turn to Acts 13, 9 with me. In Acts 13, 9 it states, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Lumis and said, and what, that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is here is then Saul, who was also called Paul. You know, in this, in the New Testament, it doesn't really talk about why Paul changed his name from Saul. If, you know, usually in biblical teachings, we just look to the fact that his old name was so tainted with his past life, that's why he just changed it. You know, and that's not, that's not really what happened. Saul changed his name to Paul or Paulus for two reasons. The first is that Paul, Paul's first convert was named Sergius Paulus, and he meant a lot to Paul. So Paul really took it upon himself to, to describe his change and how much he was a new person, that his first convert to Christianity would be his new name. And the second reason was the first city that he went to go minister to was Antioch of Galatia. And in that city at that time, the family name of Paulus carried a lot of weight. And this is bothering me. <laughs> I mean, 
apparently I have the wrong shaped ears. <laughs> but Paul changed his name to Paulus or Paul to also get his name to Roman, which would endow him for Roman citizenship. And he changed his identity to better serve and minister to the people at that time. And Paul changed his name because he found his new identity in Jesus and his old self carried no importance to him anymore. So just, just kind of think about this. You know, nowadays changing our name to go out to a new country wouldn't make a whole bunch of sense because you don't really carry yourself. All your IDs would be bad. Your passport wouldn't be any good, you know. And unlike those action movies where you change your name and everybody magically forgets about you. <laughs> but Paul just changing his name allowed him to go out and do so much more than what he was before. Just going out with a new name, a new start, and just showing how much Jesus changed his life allowed him to go out all throughout and just preach the word without any interruption from his past self or what his name carried over from his past life. And just the fact that Jesus changed him so much, made him such a new person, that he would go out and completely erase his old life shows us how much Jesus' name actually means, as you can see. <coughs> now if you will flip with me to Matthew 1, 21. I don't do any of for the best. Trust me. <laughs> Matthew 1, 21 says, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because, his, because he will save his people from their sins. And we usually look over this. We don't. We, we think that that part in that passage where it says because he will save his people from his sins. You know, we usually just go, oh, well, that that's what he's going to do. That that's the prophecy. That's that's his purpose. But realistically, the name Jesus means because he will save his people from their sins, and that that's Jesus's identity. That's what he is embodied. And not just as a person, but as the name. That name carries so much importance to his self and what he represents. And just, you know, our names don't carry the purpose like he used to. Jesus, his purpose was to go out and change the entire world. You know, it's usually hard to fathom that not just his name means that he can go out and change the world, but his identity, his self, is to go out and change the face of this planet. And, you know, writing this, I was trying to figure out what would the world really be like without Jesus? Or what would the world be like without that name meaning so much that it is? And that short, short little clip that we showed, you know, Jesus embodied enigma, you know, comparing to Hitler or Mussolini or... Shakespeare or anything like that, it's, it's kind of confusing that you're comparing Jesus to Hitler, but then again, it's almost on the same level. You know, nowadays we hear Hitler and it's automatically a negative connotation, obviously, you know. But Jesus, you know, around the world, his name can mean either a great importance like it is here, or it can be the complete opposite. You know, in history, going out and you hear the time changes, what it really meant to be a follower of Jesus and how that changed, you know. In the, in the very start when Jesus came around, that name could get you killed. Just going out and saying that out in public, that, that could cost you your life. You know, and as you kind of move throughout time and as more people follow that, that name carries so much weight that people went out and killed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people falsely under Jesus, I give you. But the fact is that they went out under Jesus' name and was able to completely change a society and what they stated, cleanse. But either way, just the fact that people can say they're under Jesus and go out and empower themselves to go and kill that many people, but it's completely opposite of what that name means. So we really have to look at Jesus and figure out, you know, how we can follow him, what his name 
means to us. You know, and what is our purpose? Because we go throughout life and, you know, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? You know, and we always ask Jesus, you know, what are we supposed to do? But on the basic level, we can just look at his name. You know, save his people from their sins. You know, on the basic principle, we can just go out and try our hardest to be like Jesus and follow his teachings and follow his actions and that will give us what we're supposed to do in life. Amen. You know, and on the same level, who do we represent? Nowadays, we, we try to orient ourselves with different people and different things in life, you know, and you, you, get, you get lost in everything because there's no central thought about who we are under. You know, we're Americans, we're in Virginia, all this stuff, you know, but who do we represent as a person? Who, where is our identity found in? You know, and let's just look back to Acts 12. I mean, you don't really have to flip there, but, you know, Acts 4, 12, sorry. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's so powerful, just in that verse alone, saying that there's no other name by which we get to heaven but through Jesus. So Jesus gives us our strength. He gives us who we are. You know, and even from the start, He gave us life. He saved us from our sins. That allows us to go out and preach and spread the word and kind of keep us from our sinly desires just by that name alone. And I just, I just want you guys to just kind of think for a second. You know, when you go throughout your life, how do you represent Jesus? How does Jesus, or how is Jesus shown in you on a daily level? We always try to figure out, and we try to be the best Christian we can be. But if we're trying to be Christian, that can get lost. We have to try to be Jesus. We have to represent him best that we can because if we go out and we say that we're Christian that we're under Jesus but yet we do the complete opposite and we don't follow what he says we're tainting his name yeah. we have to try everything that we can do to best represent him in a current context so that people look at us and they go wow those people really represent him they show how great he acts upon them so that they're clean people, you know? So, again, our identity, who we are, must be found in Jesus. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, our identity, on a personal level, has to represent Jesus the best that we can. So, you know, um, if most of you guys have your bulletins, you might come on up. Um, just kind of, there should be Sharpies in the front of the seats. You can pull out your bulletins where that hello my name is on the front of your bulletins. Most of you guys should have them if the creatures didn't do their job properly. <laughs> okay. So just, just take a couple minutes by yourself, you know, just in silence. Mike's going to play a couple of nice tunes. And just think of what Jesus means to you. There's so many names for Jesus throughout the course of this Bible. You know, Father, you know, Holy Divine, there's Yahweh, you know, all that jazz that, you know, we, we lose it without knowing and, ex at, like, providing it on a personal level. You know, so just take a couple minutes Figure out what Jesus best means to you and how that he acts and what that really means to you on a personal level. 